welcome back. And today we're gonna to try and get our TI-994 back up and running. Now the TI-994 is an incredibly rare system, which is kind of a strange thing to say when talking about TI-99s, but there are two different types of TI-99s out there. There's the 994 and the 994A. And they only made around 20,000 of the 994s while they made close to 3 million of the 4As. So what's the difference between the two? Well, most notably, it uses a older revision of the video display processor or VDP. It uses a TMS 9918, while the 4A uses a TMS 9918A. That's where the A in the name on 4A comes from. So it's really kind of an awesome opportunity to have the 99.4 here to work on, but it's also kind of pointless if it doesn't actually function. And that's where we are. We've got a dead system on our hands. In the previous episode, we tried to troubleshoot it and we came across some interesting problems that were unexpected. We had two bad 3904s and we had a bad RAM chip. Now I got a ton of messages about how I went about diagnosing the RAM chip. Mostly people were curious why I just immediately went to desoldering all eight of the TMS 4116s in there. And the answer is that uh, one of them was bad. So I needed to pull them all and put sockets in. Not because other ones might go bad, but because visually my OCD would not have allowed me to have just one socket in the middle of all the RAM chips. They had to all be replaced. I literally would have lost sleep over it having an inconsistent look to the RAM chips. But even with the RAM chips replaced, we still didn't have a booting system. There is something else very fundamentally wrong in this system. Could be the console ROMs, could be the uh, TMS 9900 itself. But, well, we've got a lot more troubleshooting to do, and I have an idea of something that I definitely know is wrong, so we're gonna start with that first and continue working our way from there. So, let's get to it, and hopefully we can have a working 99.4 by the end of the episode. I did a lot of probing of signals and everything off camera, trying to figure out at least in what direction I can run in. And uh, these two 138s over here are incredibly important. So I decided to go ahead and replace one more of these 138s here. I don't think it's the problem, but I wanna just go ahead and eliminate it because I had a spare and they're pretty easy to replace. So I uh, pulled this IC out, put a socket in, plugged it back in. And when I flipped it back over and turned it on, the entire system was dead, which uh, <laughs> invoked a lot of panic. So I checked the power supply. There's um, some lugs right here on the backside and they all checked okay. And I started checking some of the ICs and they all had good power as well until I got to this half of the board. All of the ICs on this half only had like 0.8 volts instead of the five volts for VCC. So power wasn't getting to them. And then I realized that this kind of uh, papery thing here was loose and broken. And I tried to resolder it, and in the process, I noticed that all three of these over here were broken, and then these are all loose on this side. And this is just a bus bar. This is just moving power and ground from one side of the uh, board to the other, and it is not in good shape. Through all of the handling that I've done, it's gotten very weak. So I think I need to uh, desolder it beep it out, figure out what the actual pinout of this bus bar is, and then recreate it with wires. It wasn't that difficult to actually trace it all out. There's only eight connections and half of them are connected to each other and the other half are connected to each other. It's probably five volts and ground and it's just moving those uh, connections across the board. But uh, you can see how bad it is. Seven of the eight connections are broken. If this was actually even delivering power, it certainly wasn't delivering clean power. All right, I've got the new power wires soldered in. This should get us right back up to where we were before, which would be uh, generating an empty video signal, which we should be able to see on the monitor pretty quickly. And then I've also got the scope here so I can check to see that we do actually have some data showing up on the data pins because before it was totally dead because there wasn't any power getting anywhere. So uh, I haven't actually turned this on since I did this soldering, so hopefully none of it goes up in smoke, but well, we're about to find out. 
We are generating a video signal. That's good news. We should have some data going on here. Yeah, look at that. We actually have some data happening on the data bus, so we're back up to where we were. The system is still not running, but, well, <laughs> we fixed one problem. Okay, after a full day of probing, I'm pretty sure I've eliminated a ton of stuff. The RAM should all be good, the VDP should be good, the GROMs should all be good, and the console ROMs should be good. This uh, chip down here, which I think is the clock generating chip, it is also good. Uh, both of the LS138s over here have been replaced, so we know that they're good, but we still don't have a working system. There's not a whole lot left to check. The big ticket items are gonna be these two SRAMs, the CPU itself, and the 9901. But the 9901, I'm pretty sure is just for uh, external interface. And even if it's not working fully, we should still be getting something on the screen and we're not. And I'm starting to get increasingly worried that it is the uh, CPU. Let me show you what I mean. The CPU is really close to working as it is. So if we turn the uh, computer on here, and I check some of the address lines, you can see that we have address data going about. And if we check some of the data lines, you can see that the data bus is active as well. So the CPU is trying to do something. But the problem is, is that the VDP is never getting the correct signals to write to or read from RAM. That's gonna be on pens 13 and 14 over here. And you can see that, well, they just sit perpetually high. They never have any activity on them. So the VDP is never writing any data to RAM or reading any data back out of RAM. So if we trace those signals back around, they come over here to uh, one of the LS 138s that I replaced. And we can see that, um, yeah, same signals. There's no break in uh, the traces. The 138 is just never sending the signals to them. But the 138 is receiving its instructions to uh, switch the multiplexed signals on and off via pins one, two, and three. And you can see that pins one, two, and three all have data on them. So the LS138 is receiving a three-bit input, and this is coming from address A3, A4, and A5. So it's receiving proper addresses coming in but it's never activating the correct output going out. But either way, it looks like we're stuck in a loop. You can see the data looks like it's looping around pretty consistently. And I wanna see what that loop is. So I think it's time to break out the logic analyzer and see what addresses are looping around on this board. And uh, well, I'm gonna have to clean the desk up for that because the desk is a mess at the moment. All right, it took me a little bit of time to get all of this hooked up, but I think I've got it all hooked up correctly. I spent some time yesterday and last night tinkering with it and looking at the addresses that were coming out. And I'm pretty sure that uh, it is actually showing me the addresses correctly, but that doesn't mean I can make any sense of the addresses. We're up at around the 130th uh, clock cycle here. And uh, I don't know, man, there's just crazy stuff going on here. 0184 is in the console ROM, but when you get up to the 2000 range, that's a uh, peripheral expansion area. So it's bouncing back and forth between console ROM and some expansion area every clock cycle. That seems crazy to sit on one address for a single clock cycle and then bounce back and forth for four or five clock cycles. So at this point, I've spent more time trying to diagnose whether the CPU is good or bad than it would have taken to just desolder, socket, and put a different CPU in. And so I think, I think that's our next step. Welcome to day 4,780 something of trying to diagnose this TI-994. It's, it's not going well. Uh, after I put the socket for the CPU in, I noticed that the CPU wasn't sitting very cleanly in it. It was kind of cattywampus. It would kind of rock back and forth in the socket. So I didn't have good engagement with the pins. And that was a little strange because I, I used pin headers and they felt like they had really good engagement off board, but once it was all soldered in place, it just didn't work. So I needed to change out the socket, but the pin headers I used were round pin headers, which means that they fully soldered all the way around to the pad that was on the top of the PCB. 
And that was incredibly difficult to desolder. And in the process, I lifted about five traces. So I spent all day yesterday running new bodge wires to try and fix the catastrophic mess that I had created. And well, that's what this paper is. I made a list of every pin on the CPU and what I see it should connect to and everything checks out good. And I think we're right back up to where we were, which is still a non-booting system, but it seems to be behaving the way it was behaving before. So I spent an entire day just trying to fix a problem that I created. Hooray. So it, the actual boot process for the uh, TI-99 here is that the CPU resets and addresses low ROM locations, and it looks like that's happening. The 9900 initializes. Again, it looks like that's happening because we have data and address buses activity on the buses. The uh, 9900 then sets up workspace registers in the MCM 6810 RAM. Now this is the static RAM chips right here. And these are some of the only chips that I haven't touched yet because they're not socketed. And then after that, it begins to do a Grom read that enters a delay loop, and then the sound chip is disabled. And we still just have a screaming sound chip. So we never actually make it to the sound chip is disabled. So we have a failure somewhere in the middle there. And like I said, the only thing that we haven't touched so far is the static RAM, but there's no pins being pulled high or low. So if the static RAM failed, it would have had to fail into a high impedance state. And I'm not really sure how to test for that. I did get this nice diagnostic procedure, which I believe is from Dave Guion, but I got it off of the Atari H forums. I asked a question, I'm getting pretty desperate. So I asked a question on the Atari H forums and uh, somebody provided a link to, to this. So I'm gonna go through and double check this diagnostic procedure first. And then if I still come up empty handed on this, I will pull those static ramps and swap them out. And well, we'll keep plugging away at it. There's not a whole lot of chips left that can go wrong on here because we've touched or changed just about everything. <laughs> All right, socketed, different SRAM chips in. I don't think this will work. I mean, these SRAM chips came out of a non-working system, so they could very well be bad as well. But also, I don't think the problem was in the SRAM chips, but I mean, there's really only one way to find out. So we'll turn the uh, monitor on here, and then we'll turn the power on as soon as it warms up and is giving us a picture. Yep, there we go. Here goes nothing. <laughs> yeah, nope, still doesn't work. Same problems. Uh, I, I, I'm running out of ideas. Okay, I pulled the uh, logic analyzer back out and I'm checking the memory selection logic. And all I'm really checking is the three address pins that are coming into it and the chip enable pins. And really what we want to see here is hex address 21 through 27. Most notably, we want to see 22 and 23 because this is the uh, memory select read and write for the VDP. And we uh, obviously never see that. I mean, we get kind of close. That's a 2-6, uh, but that's uh, just ready hold and Grom select, I believe. And then it's a bunch of three eights and three zeros and <laughs> it's a whole lot of three eights. So it's like the selection logic is broken, except that none of the bits are stuck. They can all go on or off. And I've seen instances of every one of these bits being on or off, selection and address alike. So these two CPUs behave the same, but that doesn't mean they're good. They could still have problems in and of themselves that's causing the selection logic to never actually work correctly. And there's no real way to test those. Except I know for a fact that I have one good CPU. That's this one right here. This is my working 99.4a, and I haven't taken any parts off of it because I don't want to break it. But desperate times, desperate measures, and all that jazz. I think we need to pull this TMS 9900 out, these two SRAM chips out, because the SRAMs that are in there could still be bad and socket these and then use the working motherboard to test all the other components and eliminate them. That way we'll know if we have good or bad CPUs, good or bad SRAMs. I've already done that with VDPs and all five of my VDPs are good. So I think that's the next step. As much as I don't wanna do it, that seems like the most logical path forward. 
All right, this is the 994A motherboard. This is a known good motherboard. This is the one that works, but I socketed the CPU and I socketed one of the SRAM sockets. Uh, so I've got the 994 VDP, the 994 ceramic CPU, and the 994 original SRAM in it. So if it boots, then those chips are good and it boots, of course it does. Um, and actually I did a bit more testing off screen uh, all of these SRAMs are good. These three SRAMs are good, which means that has four good SRAMs now. Uh, both of these CPUs are good. Uh, this is the original CPU that came in the 4A here. This CPU is bad. This is a CPU that came in Renault's 4A. So Renault, that's why your 4A never booted. It had a bad CPU in it. Uh, and all of these VDPs are good. So we have five good VDPs, four good SRAMs, or five good SRAMs, three good CPUs. <sighs> I, I'm running real low on ideas here. <laughs> well, I started this episode full of optimism and hope, and over the last week, the old 99.4 here has alleviated me of that notion. Sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug, and this time I was the bug. I don't really know the right direction to run in on this thing next. I do know that the CPU is good, the DRAM is good, the VDP is good, the ROMs are good, the GROMs are good, the SRAM is good, and the clock generator chip is good. Oh, and the power supply is good. So I've pretty much checked like 90% of the system, but the remaining 10% is an extremely convoluted and complex collection of discrete logic gates and flip-flops and very difficult stuff to trace. And I'm not entirely sure the best place to check and start checking backwards from. Um, and also, I'm assuming that the motherboard itself is good. I mean, there could be some uh, trace faults on there that I just haven't seen. This was a literal barn find with lots of rust on it. So I don't really know what's next, but I do know that I'm starting to burn out on this thing. So I'm gonna pack it up, set it in the corner, let it think about what it's done wrong for a week or two, let my subconscious chew on it, come up with a good game plan, and then we'll come back and tackle this thing again one more time, and hopefully we'll be successful that time. So, sorry we didn't make it to the end of this episode, but I want to thank you guys so much for watching anyways, and I hope to see you in the next episode.